we are of course talking about modeling how to organize your data and um, so this is really important and it does go hand in hand with performance also because it's very important um, so before we get into that who am i and who is jeff so um, I'm a data BI architect out of Denver, Colorado. Um, I've been working with data for a long time. And um, I am a Data Vault certified modeler through Genesee Academy. Um, and I do a lot in data warehousing, but I've done also a lot in transactional systems also, so application systems. Um, and Jeff is with me today. I invited him to come along because we always have interesting conversations people like to listen in on. <laughs> yeah, so that's right. And uh, you might be seeing me as Leslie Weed. There was a slight issue on how I could log in. So maybe I'm Leslie number two, or maybe I'm Jeff, depending on how the presentation turns out. Um, but yeah, more seriously, that I've worked with uh, SQL Server and modeling for a really long time. Um, Actually, I'm really excited. I'm going to be teaching a 10-week class on NoSQL uh, with, through the University of Denver starting in June. Um, so I love data, things related to data, um, especially doing some new things in the uh, uh, data science realm. So thanks for bringing me along for this. Sure. All right, so what are we gonna talk about in the next hour-ish or a little less than an hour. So why we date data model, which is very important, obviously, why, why do we want care about this? And then types of modeling. Um, we're gonna go over some basics and then we're gonna talk about how to kind of put it into practice. So that's kind of our plan. Does that sound like a good plan, Jeff? That's a great plan. All right, cool. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the history of data modeling and, and also relational databases and I know that already on some of the sessions you've heard of other types of database and data storage facilities such as big data and data lakes and NoSQL and, and some other concepts but we're going to really be focusing on the relational database so as we think about kind of the history of the relational database um, it, it's really kind of cool and us data geeks when we go back to this stuff and we look at Edgar F. Cudd and what he created back in 1970 and 69, 70, um, and really talking about the relational data model, the foundation that's created and how, I mean, it's still so important. So he really came up this with this relational model for database management, an approach to managing data using a structure and language consistent with first order predicate logic. Ooh, that's a big word. Okay. First described in 69, right, in the relational model of database, all data is represented in terms of tuples grouped into relations. A database is organized in terms of the relational model is a relational database. Whew. Okay, there's a lot there. This is really cool. What he created in 69, 70, kicked us off into relational database management systems, right? The software. There was some really early database systems that came out. MIT had one, University of Michigan had one. If you go and look at the history, it's kind of, it's fun to see how databases have emerged, right? And, and some of his basic principles are still in practice, some are not, but it's still interesting, right? Maybe that's my data geek coming out. Jeff? <laughs> Well, and I think even back in 1969, they didn't imagine one big Excel spreadsheet to hold the data. They needed some organization. Right, right. There needed to be organization, right? Data was getting too big back then. All right, so what is a relational database management system, RDBMS? If you guys are out there looking at jobs, you probably see this terminology quite a bit. This is really the software system that uses some type of a structured query language, SQL, for querying and working with the database, right? So, so this is a software system that you install on a server, on a computer that runs and creates databases, right? Um, so there's a lot going on, and you guys have already heard a lot of systems, and there's a lot that goes on there. And every version of SQL Server that has come out, right, there's new improvements, there's better and, and bigger things going on. So, so you can think between when SQL Server first came out, which was what, early 80s, to now, 
it's just amazing. It's really amazing how far we've come along. And also, as just as a world and how much data we're dealing with, just the types of data and the the transactional and, and the rate of, of data and, and the type of data has, has really pushed that need for different types of databases and different types of constructs and storage methods, right? But we're gonna bring it back down to just the relational database for this as we talk about modeling. Now, obviously, anything that holds data needs to have some type of organization. But as we talk about organization for this talk, we're going to really focus in on that relational database system. So if we look at today's modern relational database systems, these are just a few of the top big ones. So we've got SQL Server, Microsoft, right? That's what we're going to be focusing on mostly today. We will talk, up, talk a little bit about Oracle and some of the differences because though they all they're all relational database systems and you can kind of generally organize things the same way. Every relational database system has slightly different nuances and features. So there are certain things that we might actually model differently in a SQL Server to really use um, the features of it better and to make it perform better. We've also got Oracle on the list, MySQL, IBM DB2, Postgres, Teradata, which we won't talk about Teradata because Jeff might give frowny faces a little bit, but Teradata is out there also. There's many more. There's also a lot of, of niche players out there. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, no, just I'll be good on the Teradata. So again, like on platform differences, uh, Teradata's MPP architecture, we won't get into that. That's more advanced, but there's some slightly different strategies you might and take when modeling for MPP. Right. So the big key takeaway here is um, a lot of us tend to navigate towards a single platform, towards a specialist platform, because we start to learn those nuances and we can perform really well in a single platform. I, I mean, SQL Server has really been my key go-to for years, right? There are people that really focus on Oracle. They know Oracle in and out, and they really focus on those environments. So it's just something to be aware of, especially if you're coming into the field and you're new to these systems. Um, there's a lot of different platforms. Some things might behave differently, okay? All right, so why our method for storing data as appropriate for the use of that data, our purpose, right? So our goal for our organizing our data is performance, scalability, longevity, consistency, and a decrease of needed development, maintenance, resource time in the future, right? Oh my gosh, this is a big one, right? And as we talk about this, this is where a lot of us that have been in the field for 10 plus years and, and even less than that, we go in and we're dealing with some of these legacy systems that we, we feel pain, right? Something just was not modeled correctly. Something just didn't work. And we're dealing with a lot of pain because of that. I think everybody's done that, right? Jeff, you, you've probably been in a few clients where there's a little pain there. Oh, and I, you know, I love when things aren't quite modeled, right? So you have to union a bunch of data or, uh, you know, do you cross applies or, or weird, really weird stuff to get around the data model? Yeah, yeah. So it's really important as we start off or even as we're adding on to a system that we're very thoughtful because these are our goals as we're thoughtful about organizing our data is to really achieve some of these items. Okay, so methodologies methodologies of modeling for relational databases. So let's talk about some of the modeling terms you might hear. So third normal form is, is a consistent across the board. You will hear third normal form if you are going into application development, if you're database development. Third normal form is something that everybody is pretty aware of. You'll see that also in a lot of job descriptions. Dimensional, dimensional came out in the 90s. Dimensional is heavily used on the reporting side of the house in data warehouses and data marts. Data vault, um, is a slightly newer methodology. It's still pretty old right now, but um, Data Vault has really started to take a big break uh, out of Dimensional because people have worked with Dimensional. There's part of Dimensional that just doesn't always work for situations. So Data Vault has come in, anchor, hyper agility, focal point, temporal, and a new relationship. 
Anthony, you probably have never heard of all these. <laughs> but, right, you know, just kind of go that, through them. I was like, <laughs> yeah, right. There's a lot there, and there's many more, right? And some of these are hybrids of each other, and there's concepts that are used in these that are used in other ones too. So, what I just wanted you to know about is, you know, there there are modeling terms out there, modeling methods out there that you might not have been aware of, or especially as you go, if you're starting new in a data professional, you might go into data warehousing and all you see is dimensional and you don't realize there's another type of way to model things. So, so this is kind of, hey, there are a lot of different types of modeling things. It's good to start to learn these so that you can compare and understand what these concepts are doing and how they're helping for certain situations as you come up with complex things in your data. Okay, so the, so this slide is specifically about data warehousing and, and Jeff, this probably looks familiar to you. Um, so as we kind of talk about data warehousing specifically, um, we've, we've seen kind of a progression. So in, um, in, in the early days of data warehousing, Inman was the first one to come out with a how to implement a data warehouse book. And Inman did a third normal form, okay? A very business concept heavy third normal form, right? In the 90s, Kimball came along and said, you know, that's just not working for reporting, right? We're really having problems doing enterprise reporting. So Dimensional came around and Dimensional focuses on um, numbers, values, and then attributes. Well, so, you know, we work with the, that quite a bit and then Dan Lindstad said, hey, you know, dimensional is really not working across the board and, and we lose a lot of meaning in the data warehouse by using dimensional because we lose this raw layer. So if our KPIs change over time or our business logic change over time, we might have lost data that was really important to reapply those KPIs or that, that business logic. And so this, this different method of data vault came out and, and Inman is also a big supporter of, of Data Vault now. And it comes, goes back to business concepts. And, and it's really geared to saying, you know, the business understands things like customer and orders and product. And we should model towards those concepts, right? We shouldn't model towards, you know, I've opened up databases and I've seen tables called 5362 and 786. And it's like, what are in those tables? I have no idea. So the idea between with data vault is really we're really focused on meaningful organization of the data that a business user can really go in and, and understand. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And I would also say, like if you had a good model, your third normal form model create gives you good data, consistent data, uh, no duplicates, it's accurate, a uh, good data warehouse. You're able to integrate multiple sources together in a way that makes sense and that if you have more data to add or changes you could do that in a cost-effective timely manner yeah. those are good but good yeah. models okay so where do we start when when we're doing a database and, and we're organizing and we're going to have to create tables where, where do we start well well typically we have requirements right we usually have a business owner or somebody that needs something right they need to be able to store data. They need to, you know, get bids in and then process those bids, or they need to do invoices, or, or you know, the sky's the limit, right? There's all sorts of things that need to happen. So you, typically, there's requirements. It's not us data geeks sitting in the corner saying, "Ooh, what can we build?" It's usually a business professional that says, "Hey, I'm I I have a problem and I need to solve it." because we need to include more data or, or, you know, marketing is huge with data. We need to, we need to start bringing these surveys in so we can really start analyzing them. Um, so requirements are really where we start. And we need to always have those conversations around requirements so that we really understand them so that we can start to go brainstorm and figure out what are we looking at. So a lot of times we, we talk conceptually as we start, right? We, we wanna understand what are we looking at as we talk about sentences and, and things the business user says they want and breaking those sentences apart. Well, we really look at the things they're talking about and we wanna break them, back, break them down in a way that's gonna be meaningful to us to understand 
and make sure that we're delivering something that's going to be useful to them. So a lot of times we get together and we pull out the sticky notes and we start writing down what are the important things that I'm hearing? What are the requirements? So we might have customers and employees and stores and products and inventory and date, things that we know we're going to have data around, right? And we start to organize those things and we, we, talk, we have conversations. We don't go sit in a corner by ourselves and try to create this on our own because you know what? We're going to miss something. But we have conversations with our business, so we really are engaging, understanding their needs, making sure we're including the right, all the right fields that need to be included. Um, product, do I care about the color of product? Do we need a store product color? Does it change over time, right? We, we start asking those questions so we can really start to build something that's gonna be useful. Now, what I do wanna caution you about is we don't go out and try to build everything to start off with right we're getting into this agile concept right not, not agile by the book but agile as to be reactive we don't want to boil the ocean right because it's going to take us three years to build a data warehouse before we put it out there it's not what we want to do we want to really break stuff down and and build and promote and get it out there so we can have successful iterations and stuff that is meaningful to business to the business sooner versus later okay all right so so real fun here one of the things we use a lot and uh jeff i know will like this so so microsoft whiteboard is one one of the things we use a lot um jeff you want to talk about how you've used it um yeah sure so again with uh with the users and we have sticky notes we're talking about key concepts so when we say, hey, who in your organization, uh, do you have an example in the sticky notes as employees, but maybe you have a, a person that's actually doing a sale. Uh, what would you call that person that uh, maybe runs the, the cash register at the checkout at a grocery store, for example? Is that like a clerk, a sales associate, salesperson? Um, what, what is good about this is you might have different people calling that same role different names. Um, so you can say, oh, I might have synonyms associated to this, but you can't really see it until you would um, draw these out per se uh, with logical names and group them. Right. Um, what we would also say, hey, when you have sales, um, is it actually in a store, brick and mortar, or do you have online sales? So where's the places that you're actually getting and create, creating these orders? Um, and then you'll see, uh, uh, you know, order details associated to it if it's online. Um, some other concepts that you might think about is a customer got something and they didn't like it, so you have a return. So would you call it like a customer return or a product return? Oh, I can't type fast enough. I, I need to slow down. I had too much coffee. Get excited about these modeling Product things. Product return. Product returns. Yep. Um, like other concepts your business might have. Uh, do you have uh, discounts or coupons uh, for your products and promotions? Um, are those considered one thing or multiple things? Cool. So as we start to put this stuff on the board, we can kind of start to say, oh, I can kind of see how things are related. I know I have to have an employee associated to an order and I have to have a store related to an order, right? So I can start to see how some of this can work. And, I, and I'm a big visual learner and most people are. So when you can really put this up on the board and really start to talk about this organization on the board, it makes a huge difference. Um, so I think a lot of people are familiar with Kanban, um, sprints or agile methods out there. It's very similar. Of course, we're talking about organizing data, but you're still using those same tools, right? You're using those tools in a different way to visualize. So as we visualize our work for two weeks, we visualize also our diagram right in doing something like this this is very helpful because what i can do is i can actually go to a business person and talk to them they understand this right they understand a store they understand an order they understand an employee they'll get this we can have those conversations 
they can say, oh, you know what? We don't really deal with coupons. We only deal with discount codes. Okay, great. Well, what would I do? I'd come in here and I'd change this to discount codes, except if I didn't have my ink on, right? So I'd change this to discount codes because they said, you know what? This is what we really call it discount codes. We don't have the, the concept of coupons. They mean something different to our business. All right. All right, so that was just kind of a fun little show and tell. So we use um, whiteboards quite a bit, right? Obviously, Microsoft Whiteboard being online, we can collaborate. You can have multiple people join those whiteboards in your organization and collaborate just like you can with a lot of uh, conference schools also have the whiteboards. Um, use them, right? I know it's nice to be able to draw when you're in person in a, in a room, but we still have the ability to do that. So, okay, so where do we start? Now, let's talk a little bit about the difference between OLTP versus OL, OLAP, because these are also terminology that you will come across. So, OLTP is a transactional system, right? These are typically what your applications are built off. And again, we're talking about relational databases. So, our goal of an OLTP is fast query processing, maintain referential integrity. That means I need to make sure that if I'm referring to something like a color that I have the color in the database, et cetera. Um, and so this is very operational, right? This is where data usually starts, right? We have um, people that are entering data for a variety of reasons within our systems, you know, our ERP systems and our um, accounting systems, those are big applications, right? They're transactional systems. Then we look at OLAP and analytical systems. These are data warehouses, data marts, typically. There's a lot of different terminology out there. Um, but overall, when we talk about OLAP, our goal is different than our transactional system. Now, they can both be databases on a relational database system, but our goal is going to be slightly different, so we might model those differently. Okay, That's the big key here is, is because my goal of my system is different, and might need a model differently. So our data warehouses and data marts are usually very complex and heavy, heavy aggregations because we're dealing with a lot of data and a lot of history, right? So these are usually our go-to systems when it really comes to reporting and mining data and doing more of that enterprise level reporting. So from multiple systems, right? If I only care about the general ledger and what's been entered this week, I would probably go to my ERP. If I care about understanding trends of how certain ledgers behave or how we've been operating with it, we might actually want to go to the data warehouse and create that analytical system. So this is just terminology I just want you to understand the difference of. Fair? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about normalization. There's some big words in here, but let's just talk about it because this is one of the things. And, and I always go back, you know, I, I'm fairly old and it's not that I'm losing my memory, but we don't model every day. But when we have to model, sometimes we wanna go back and remind ourselves just kind of the basics. So normalization, which is just the process of organizing how our columns and tables will look and we really wanna minimize data redundancy, right? So Third normal form, which is the traditional normalization, right? Third normal form, you will see 3NF out there a lot. It's good to kind of understand the 1NF and the 2NF and 3NF, not necessary to really model, but you know, as you get experience, you can come back and really study these again, okay? So really normalizations, we're really about data redundancy, so reducing that data. So what does that mean? So if we look at the data at the top of this chart, like if you think of an Excel spreadsheet, right, a flat table with rows and columns, right, you can have a lot of repeating data. So if I look at this, I see, oh, my game date is all the same on these rows. The game type is the same on all these rows. The season is the same on all these rows. So as I start to think about modeling and how I might break this data set apart, right? I look and I see, okay, well, player might make sense because I might have additional attributes or information about player that would come in. So I might have the height for Alex Albright, and I might have the birth date, right? 
So that's going to be stuff that's very specific to the player. So I might have a player table. Okay, well then I see I have game type and game dates. Well, game dates, so maybe I need a table for games, right? The date the game is, the stadium the game is going to be at, right? We can kind of think about that. And then I see, oh, well, I got these regular seasons. A game might be part of a season, but maybe I really want a seasons table because maybe I have a fall season and a spring season, right? We think about some of that youth soccer or some of the other um, youth sports, and they have multiple seasons. So I might actually want a season table so I can really specify those out. All right. Yep. And, and also sometimes with seasons, uh, the seasons don't align with the calendar as well. So with football, the you know this is the 2012 season. Actually, we go into 2013 for the playoffs. So it makes it convenient to have that season in there so you can group the data for reporting. Right. So we're really trying to reduce the data. Now, I want to say one point about reducing data. Right. So, so obviously, if I have a lot of repetitive data in a table, that might be a key, a key candidate to have pulled out into a separate table to normalize it. So, typically, we don't have the same data living more than once in our database, such as player name. I would expect to see player name exist only in one table. Well, that was really true in the 90s and, and early century, right? Because because what we wanted was we wanted to conserve space. Well, is space cheap these days? Anthony, how much is space these days? It's pretty cheap, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, depending on the performance profile, right? Well, that's true, that's true. <laughs> right. But yes, it, I'd like to make the joke that the cheapest thing in your data center is the hardware, right? The data yeah. and the people are the most expensive things. The people that have yes. to work on the systems. Yeah. That is that is absolutely true. Um, so so our our mindset about normalization and reducing repetitive data has changed a little bit. I would say in the last ten to fifteen years, because space has greatly decreased in cost. If we have a reason to store the data twice, then we can do it. Okay, somebody's going to quote me on that. Somebody's going to come knock on my door and say what? <laughs> <laughs> we have a reason to store the data twice, do it, right? We do need to make sure our integrity stays the same as if there's an application that I'm still updating the right row, where I need to be updating it, deleting it, etc., and that my references stay the same. So if Dan Bailey is related to the game on 9.5, I don't destroy that relationship, okay? All right, so Correct. space is cheap though. And, and, you know, I'd also say, Leslie, we ran across uh, data sets where we got data's name value pairs, and that's how we started, and anybody could do a pivot. Uh, but with lots of data, sometimes the pivots take a long time to run, so that storing the data twice where you pivot it out for people is a lot of value added, that it makes queries uh, less complicated for people to create, and they'll run faster. So yeah, that, and, and that's a great, that. great example of where we you really might want to store that data twice. The second one, pivoting it for the user, so, so changing that from the key value pair to columns and rows, that makes sense to them, right? While that's a value added pair, right? It's not our primary table, it's more of a business logic table, right? So our main key value table would still be where entry happens. Okay, so let's keep going because I know See, we're already talking. I invite Jeff and we just talk away. All right. Keys are an important thing for you to understand for modeling. Okay. So there's primary keys. They can be a single field or multiple fields, <clears throat> columns, single column, multiple columns. Um, foreign keys. Okay. That's a, a key that relates to another you know, my record in one table relates to another record. We use a foreign key to help represent that and store that. Um, clustered and non-clustered keys, natural keys and surrogate keys. So these are all types of terminologies you wanna understand um, as you're modeling. 
um, especially natural and surrogate. So a surrogate key is an identity field or some type of an identity field that your system is creating. So a surrogate key is a key that's created by the database. It's not a natural key that comes in from an external natural wor world source. So like social security numbers are kind of a natural key, right? None of us generate them, but everybody has one, right? It's somewhat of a natural key. And people know what the social security number means, right? So it's somewhat of a natural key. Our name is a natural key, but what's the problem with our names? Well, there are actually other Leslie Weeds in the world. <laughs> exactly. I'm surprising, one. right? I am not unique. Right, we have two right now. <laughs> <laughs> right? See? Just stole my name. So, uh, there's a, couple, a question popped up, and it might be this topic or it might be the previous topic. Okay. But you're talking about storing data twice. How do you, or what are the techniques involved in maintaining the integrity of the data and the change in those two different systems? Or right. potentially two different storage locations. Right, absolutely. So there's a couple techniques that can be used to maintain that integrity. So if you are doing that in an application, so an OLTP transactional system, right, you would want to designate one as your primary, your main focus record, right? And that would be the one that you are making sure always has. That is your, your update, delete, you know, um, where you do your CRUD statements, create, insert, update, delete records against, right? From that table, there's a couple options, right? I can have something called a trigger in Microsoft SQL. So if I go to insert a record in that main table, it'll automatically do something. I have to write the code, but it'll do something now to that second table. I can say, okay, if I insert to this table in my trigger, I can insert to my next table automatically, right? Or what I might choose to do is, is um, run a job that does that because maybe I need to pick up any additional columns in my pivot, right? And if I have a job that's always the secondary, it's not the main, but it's the secondary, um, you know, that's one way. But it's really understanding what is your parent record, right? What is your record of truth? And that's what it is. That second table, like I said, it's a business logic table. It's a secondary one. It's a helpful table, but it's not the main table, right? So it, it's purpose, designating purpose on those tables. So while I have redundant data, that redundant data and those tables that redundant data lives in, I need to make sure that purpose and how it's being used is well-defined, okay? So hopefully that helps. If not, ask another question. All right, so keys are an important concept. We do need to go back and understand our keys. Um, so primary keys, foreign keys are our relationship keys between two tables, relational database, right? So of course we've got keys. Um, clustered and non-clustered natural circuits. Okay, so we talked about that a little bit. So here's just a quick kind of example to represent one. And this comes from you know, SQL Server Management Studio has a way to do database diagrams in there. So this is from that. So these are very similar. You, you'll see I have an uh, employee table and a position assignment table on the top, and I have the same at the bottom. So the one on the top, I have a primary key on ID. Okay, that's going to be my surrogate key of the system. And then in my position assignment, I have an ID. Now, I will say that this is a super bad example. Jeff, why is this a super bad example? You're using a generic ID in all the different tables, yes. and it can get very confusing when you're joining at times to just a generic uh, column like that. Okay, biggest pet peeve. We should never use the word ID by itself ever for a column name, ever, ever. <gasps> never. I'm gonna have an application developer say, what? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and honestly, like when you're working with other developers, we want to minimize uh, any mistakes we can because it can be, uh, of course, we don't want bugs, but time consuming to figure out how did we give up on a join. So being very explicit um, with, with calling things IDs make it easier joining tables together. Right. So what I might actually do is I might replace the ID, rename that to 
employee SK or an employee PK. And when I rename it there, I also have to rename it in the position assignment table. So, so here I've got an employee, right? So, so my name might be in here. And according to this, I would be related to position assignment once and only once, right? So this is telling me, hey, I'm related to position assignment. I'm only allowed to have one assignment, okay? Because that employee uh, primary key would be in there only once because of the way the key is represented, okay? If I look at the bottom one now, oh, well, I have a clustered key over here with multiple fields, columns, ID, company number, position level, and start date. Okay, so the combination of those fours will create my uniqueness of the record. So that means I could live in position assignment multiple times because I could work for company number one and company number two, and I could be a BA there, and I could be a CEO at the other company. Okay. So this is really changes the definition of how we're relating, right? So now I've got on top, I've got a one-to-one, -one, and at the bottom, I've got a one-to-many. And so our primary key, right, is um, how is a clustered key, right, that is shows us how things are stored on disk, right? Our non-clustered keys, now I can have non-clustered key on here also, right? That would be additional ways in order for to help with indexes and uniqueness or something along those lines. So, so we're not going going to go into clustered and non-clustered because I I think that for somebody new that's kind of a little slightly next concept for modeling, just terms you will need to learn it when you eventually create tables and stuff. Okay, so one to one, one to many, cool. Jeff. So, so one other thing, uh, when you're looking at the table that Leslie has, um, some people might say, hey, I want to maybe take my company and do CMPY uh, underscore NBR. Um, do you recommend that versus spelling things out? And in the SQL Server world, I, I would spell things out like you would see. Um, you could do uppercase with an underscore between names, or you could do camel casing. But what you want to do is define your standards up front. Is that how you're going to call columns? Um, and so if you have other people adding to your model, they follow that pattern of uh, everything in uppercase and underscore between names. You don't want to start seeing other developers add camel cases and abbreviation on things um, just from a stylistic standpoint for modeling. Right, so consistency and naming convention, yep. Okay. So relationships, we kind of just covered this. So we had a one-to-one. -one. You can have a one-to-many. You can have a many-to-many. -many. So I can have many records from one table related to many records from another table. Those get really hard to deal with. There, we get further down to tabular, our, our, our bigger OLAP systems here, and um, Power BI, and sometimes they don't like those many-to-many. -many, so we got to kind of be careful here. Recursive is something that refers to itself. So if I have a table of employees, and in that tables I have a concept of a manager and somebody reports to that manager, I might have a recursive concept of a relationship because I might have that employee, but then I might have the relationship to the manager that lives in the same table. Okay, so that's just a quick example of that. Um, and then there's a redundant relationship, which is things we need to be careful of. Um, you know, now the newer systems are really helping highlight where you might accidentally have a redundant relationship and uh, you really want to avoid those. So, so that's where you might have table A related to table B and B is related to C. And then you also put A related to C. Well, you don't want that. So, um, it, you know, there's things to help with that. So those relationships are, are one of the key things you just need to understand about how tables work with each other. Okay, so this is an, a big piece of modeling. So again, one to one, one record to one record, one record to many records, many to many. Um, this is notation down on the right. Um, there's several different notation types. Um, so you can obviously Google these. This is just an example. 
um, but you might see something like crow's crow's notation. Um, let's see, there's another one. There's there's several different forms of notation, so you can look any of these up. And these are used on when we really get into more of the the logical data modeling, and we have all the tables with the data types, and and they get pretty complex. Okay. Okay, let's talk about constraints really fast. So a check it straight is a rule that identifies acceptable column values for a data in a row within a SQL Server table. Um, they help enforce domain integrity. Uh, domain integrity defines the valid values for columns within a database table. Okay, so here's where we kind of play into, especially in a transactional system, what kind of constraints do I want to have on the database side versus what kind of constraints I might have in my code base for the web application, right? And so we might decide to enforce things more on the database side versus in the application code. And this is conversations you would have to have as something's being developed out. Um, a check constraint can validate the domain integrity of a single column or multiple columns you can have multiple check constraints for a single column. So maybe it can, it has to be a number one through 10 and it has to be a number, right? So that's two constraints. If data being inserted or updated violates a check constraint, the database engine will not allow the insert or update operation to occur. So you can, you know, it will warn you if something's wrong. So I have seen where some applications really use this use the constraints on the database side and they feed those errors back to the application code and the application will raise it right so record would not be fully inserted if not everything was invalid okay so those are examples of constraints so we can enforce this on our database and our model side so this is one of the things you might want to consider for modeling so column value requires a positive value these are additional examples it has a valid range um, maybe the value is from a predefined list. So salary type, hourly, monthly, or annual. Uh, column value requires data. So it cannot be empty, it cannot be null. Okay, so constraints. All right, data types and storage. Now data types and storage are super important piece of modeling, right? So if I have a date field, and, and I put it into my table as a text field, well, what happens? Jeff, what happens? Well, it, it's hard to search on if you have a date as text, like you would want to say greater than April 1st for some records. Well, text, that doesn't work for your date. So you'd have to maybe do a cast in your code, which would cause overhead in your code running versus just saving it as a correct data type in the first place. Right. Okay, and so let's say I'm in um, Peru and I need to create an application that shows both English and I'm gonna get this wrong, Spanish. Or are they, what's, I'm, I'm Portuguese. Or maybe it's all three. Let's say it has to have all three languages. What are some of the data types I need to take into consideration if I'm dealing with different languages? Mm -hmm. Right, the special characters. Um, so I think you're talking about the trade off between a, like a Barkar data type versus NBarkar. That uh, NBarkar does cost you some extra storage, but if you have like Chinese symbols or German umlauts and things like that, you'd have to go with the NBarkar data type. Uh, and you know, it, it costs you extra in the storage space, but you know, you have it, it's worth it. Right. Okay, so, so understanding our data types and what is available. So as you see down below, I called out money. So money is a special data type in SQL Server. It's funny because I'll work with a developer that came from an Oracle group and they're like, money? What are you talking about? Well, Oracle doesn't have a data type money. So, so that's just another example where things are slightly different. So if you're modeling for SQL Server and you get to the data, types portion you kind of need to understand that so of course microsoft has this wonderful their wonderful docs and you know i we're constantly googling i mean i don't i don't remember off the top of my head the ranges of integers and floats 
I don't. It's something I don't memorize. <laughs> <laughs> so if I go in here and I say SQL server data types, right? All right, cool. I know I'm looking for the Microsoft doc one here. All right, cool. So, so I can come in here and really go back and refresh my memory. Okay, numeric versus decimal. Which one do I want? Sometimes I, I forget, right? And so I can come in here and say, okay, which one do I want? I'll come in here. I'll see how big it is, if the decimals count, what it represents. Definitely look at the examples. And this is great because I do have a numeric versus um, a decimal. So I can I can figure out which one I truly need for, for whatever application I'm working at the time. Money is a great one. And, and one of those things is we gotta be concerned about is rounding and, and summing and how many decimal places we have to have. So, you know, as we're modeling and we get to the data type portion, data types matter. So we gotta be very conscious of data types we're picking. So that's why I'm so calling out, out here. We have a couple of questions. Um, well, a comment on money. Uh, one of the more challenging database projects I've ever worked on was converting to money for uh, developer requirements. They wanted to use that data type because what's the one thing that's going to get us all fired if we mess up, right? Yep. <laughs> money. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, someone says you were right about Peru it is Spanish. And someone has a question about casting and code and how that causes performance overhead. If you want to dive into that or maybe field it later, it's up to you guys. Sure. Well, you, yeah. So um, I know that um, it, Kathy is coming up with T-SQL and, and I bet she'll cover some casting and converting on her T-SQL later. So I'm, I don't want to go into a lot of that. Um, a lot of times when we're loading a data warehouse um, tables, we do have to cast and convert coming in because we do want that consistency, especially if we're pulling a field from two different places. So for instance, right. if I'm pulling in a name from um, our, an operational system one, right? Maybe that's my marketing system. And then I've got another system coming in. I might have one data type that's varcar 50, right? And I might have another, that name, though it should be the same, is a data type varcar 60. Well, what happens is, is, you know, I can have a truncation error come up. And I love you SQL Server 2019 that now tells me exactly which column will get truncated. I'll tell you what, that's the best thing since sliced bread for me. I can't tell you how many times I've spent trying to find which column is getting truncated, right? And truncated means, right, it's gonna drop part of the values because it it says, whoa, you're trying to put me in a smaller spot than I need. I need a larger spot. So, so what happens is we, we typically program towards the larger spot. Remember, it's always easy to increase. It's much harder to decrease, right? Rule of thumb, we can always increase, it's harder to decrease. We do wanna be conservative on our space. Obviously, we don't wanna make everything of a varcar 5000 right we don't want to make every data type of varcar 5000 we want to be be data types is one of those chores that we really kind of spend a lot of time on um so casting converting will come along there's times when we have to use it especially into a data warehouse um application side of the house Either way, modeling, right, we're choosing our data types appropriately, right? And that's gonna save us from doing that casting and converting where we shouldn't need to. That's why we don't wanna blanket through creating a bunch of tables with VARCAR 5000. Okay. And, and I would say like another good example, uh, I was working with some COVID data recently, and if you're doing calculations and you're gonna spit back out percentages, I would save the data natively as that numeric value and then in a view or a stored procedure out, you could uh, create it as a percentage and even add the percentage label where it becomes text out. But behind the scenes, I'd store it as that actual numeric value. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's really interesting as we start to learn our system. So I might have an operational database with one data type. Our warehouse, we might choose a different data type because it's more consistent with reporting. And then we go to Power BI or some other reporting tool and it completely changes that data type for us, <laughs> right? 
So Good. it's really interesting knowing across the system how these data pieces move so we understand those data types appropriately. Date, date time, date time offset. These are big, big data types for us, right? These are, are really things that we deal with day in and day out and we, we sometimes beat our heads on our keyboards consistently because of this. So for us that work on international systems, that date time offset is key, right? I need to know not the date time of where the server lives in China. I need to know the date time the user put it in in their time zone. So that date time offset is a very key type of data type to allow me to do that without doing a lot of overhead providing additional columns oh that users in that time zone and you know if i have to add in those extra columns to to tell me what date to display okay fine but if i have the option to use a, pro, a data type like date time offset where i don't have to include extra columns to figure it out that's what i want to do i want to include that date time offset um uh, i do you want to remind you guys you're kind of coming up on a little bit over time so just kind sure. of take that into account sure Perfect. We did it. I, I would say one last point on data types that some people don't understand, but it's very important is that float data type versus numeric or decimal. That float is an approximation of a number. And that actually, a long time ago, back when I had hair, didn't realize that we were saving things as a float data type and uh, the, the data wasn't quite right um, because we had done that. So you, you want to be very conscious and recognize um what flip can do to your data if you need exact precision because it's an approximation of a number yeah so and just remember date types can be very specific to your system not all date types used in sql server are used in net code right and not all date types in sql server are used in excel Right. So be aware that yeah. everybody kind of has their own little flavor of date types. You just got to understand how they play together a little bit. There, there is a chart that shows the intersection of the .NET object data types and also the SQL Server data types. So that does exist if you have to correlate between them. Oh, one that's one. awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I'll have to look that one up. All right. Well, that was that's really a lot. I, I we really kind of covered a lot about basics, right? The I wanted to really talk about a lot of the key terms that are used because those are the things you need to kind of study and understand in order to really start organizing your tables, okay? So let's talk about a little bit more resources that are out there. And these are the ones I want to talk about because I know there's a lot of people that write blogs out there. Um, there's also a lot of misinformation, as we know, on the internet, there's a lot of misinformation. So I want to point you guys to, to good sources to start with. So Pluralsight and edX both have great modeling classes in dimensional, third normal form, warehousing, application development. They, they have flavors of, of modeling classes that you can go take on both of those. Genesee Academy is where Jeff and I were, were Data Vault certified. Hans Holgren runs Genesee Academy. He has a blog um, and a great training class for Data Vault. Um, I'm a big Data Vault fan. So if you have any interest in Data Vault, let me know. Happy to point you that way. A great place to get information. Um, Kimball Group, of course, they um, are not around anymore. Kimball did retire, but all of his resources are still up. And of course, all of his books still exist dimensional. Um, one of the ones I didn't put on here was uh, Lawrence Kaur's Agile Data Warehousing book which is also an excellent, excellent resource. And I'll get that up here. Um, obviously the Microsoft reference docs, Microsoft docs online, we all use it all the time. Google, right? Um, the, authority, the authority for all our SQL Server work. Um, please feel free to reach out. If you do have any questions, more than happy to guide you, provide answers, point you in a direction. Um, so Leslie at thedatafactor.com, at Weederbug, um, also, you've got Jeff Renz with me. I can also always forward information for him um, and his stuff was up there earlier also. So, so that really wraps it up. Any other questions? Um, not directly from the audience. I have a battery of questions. Um, maybe we can do those offline, but this was honestly one of the best 
modeling sessions I think I've ever seen. So congratulations on a fantastic session. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thanks. And it, I want to remind everyone with. Oh, sorry. I want to remind yeah, everyone with that plug to fill out the session evaluation, <laughs> which is in the chat. <laughs> fill out the session information. <laughs> Hi, Monica. Hey, guys. Really great session. I caught the whole thing, and I agree with Anthony 100%. That was fantastic.